Hi everyone, my name is Sahil. I'm an MCAT tutor here at Shamasi and Academic Consulting. Today we'll be going over a bio and biochem passage, and I'll discuss some of the strategies you can use when encountering questions like these on the MCAT. Um, this passage is probably a little bit more on the medium, maybe hard side for in terms of difficulty. Um, and for test day, you'll want to be shooting for around a pace of around eight minutes per passage for the science sections. Obviously today, um, since I'm going to be walking through this, I'll be going a little slower than that. But for your own independent practice, shoot for around eight minutes per passage. Alrighty, so with that all out of the way, um, let's dive into this. And for the passage, we're going to be using the outlining strategy. So after every paragraph, I'm just going to jot a few notes um, summarizing what I just read. So let's go ahead and start off with paragraph one. Five alpha reductases are integral membrane enzymes that catalyze the conversion of testosterone into the more potent androgen, dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. Mutations in the expression of this enzyme have been associated with prostate cancer and improper sexual development in males. There are two primary 5-alpha reductase isozymes, type 1 or SRD5A1. Isoenzymes are primarily found in sweat glands, while type 2 or SRD5A2 are primarily found in hair follicles. All right, so like I said, I'm just going to jot down some notes here. Um, after reading this passage or this paragraph, I mean, um, what really just sticks out to me is the uh, enzymes here that they mentioned. It seems like this is going to be kind of what's key here because they talk about these five alpha reductases and that there's two types of them and the particular um, reaction they catalyze, which is the conversion of testosterone into DHT. So I'll just put a little note here for myself, uh, 5AR, and I'm going to use some shorthand. Uh, just to save myself some time and um, just because space is also limited here for me. On test day, you will get a like laminated notebook, um, so you'll have lots of room to write what you need to, but it's also just good to be using shorthand just to save some time. So 5AR, uh, I'll say converts T into DHT, and then they also talked about type 1 versus 2. So that to me is what the main stuff is here, and that's how I'd like to summarize this paragraph what 5AR catalyzes and the two types, and that there are two types of this enzyme. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to our second paragraph now. SRD5A2 has been found to be involved in androgenetic alopecia, or hereditary hair loss. Although the exact mechanism is not understood, it is theorized that affected individuals express androgen receptors, or AR, on hair follicles. The binding of DHT to AR triggers a signaling cascade, which ultimately results in the miniaturization of hair follicles. Finasteride is one of the most common drugs used to treat this condition. The drug competitively binds to SRD5A2, thereby reducing the formation of DHT. Okay, so a lot of information was presented there, but they are just building up, uh, building off of what they mentioned in like the first paragraph about this enzyme and now the role it plays in a certain condition um, that they call uh, androgenetic alopecia. And then they talk about a uh, treatment that's used, this finasteride, and that it specifically competitively binds to SRD5A2, so that type 2 enzyme. So that's all sticking out to me. Um, a lot of information, but I do think I can sum this up a bit. So maybe we'll say, um, well, another key thing I should mention is that in addition to the actual like uh, condition that this is all associated with, they did talk about the mechanism of this condition, or at least what's theorized um, to be the mechanism. So there is this part right here where they say it's theorized that affected individuals express androgen receptors on hair follicles, and then that DHT, that hormone we talked about earlier, that more potent androgen, dihydrotestosterone, that binds to this AR, or the androgen receptor, on the hair follicle, and that seems to trigger some sort of signaling cascade, which then causes uh, what they say miniaturization of hair follicles. Um, that I think is also going to be key here. They're talking about a, a mechanism behind this condition, and it involves this hormone um, that we uh, mentioned in the in our outline um, in the first for the first paragraph, that DHT. So I think I would make sure to include that in my um, outline. And then I also do want to touch on um, that treatment, that finasteride, just because they talk a good bit about it here. And I think that could be some useful info down the uh, later on in the passage. So maybe I'll write DHT 
binds AR and that leads and maybe I'll just put downward arrow here so you could say that miniaturization and also I'll put F for finasteride and just it's a long word so I'm just gonna uh, short it down to just shorten it down to F um, and I'll write F uh, com competitive because they mentioned it competitively binds and then I'll say inhibits um, the 5AR2. So I could write down SRD5A2. Um, so we'll write that. Although I'm a little crunch for space here. But basically what I wrote was DHT binds AR, that mechanism for the condition that we were uh, introduced with. And then also that the treatment F or finasteride competitively binds or competitively inhibits the SRD5A2 enzyme. All right, so now let's go ahead and move on to our third paragraph. Dutasteride is another commonly prescribed antiandrogen. Like finasteride, dutasteride is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. However, in the United States, the drug is currently not approved to treat androgenetic alopecia. A team of researchers was interested in comparing the efficacy of finasteride and dutasteride in treating androgenetic alopecia. All right, so a little bit shorter than the previous uh, paragraph. Um, seems like now we got this other drug and we're interested in seeing how this compares to finasteride. So I'll just sum that up and I'll use some shorthand again um, that we have a study here and it's D for dutasteride versus F for finasteride. All right, paragraph four. The researchers recruited 300 males from ages 18 to 45 with moderate to severe androgenetic alopecia. The participants were split into three groups. In group one, participants were treated with one milligram of oral finasteride daily. In group two, participants were given one milligram of oral dutasteride daily. In group three, participants were given an oral placebo daily. To assess the efficacy of the drugs, researchers monitored the percent change in circulating levels of DHT every four weeks for 24 weeks. All right, so now they talk about the study design, um, how the study was carried out, you know, the sample size and um, the participants that were involved. Um, and then there's a figure uh, of some of the data they collected in figure one. So there's a lot of information here. I think I'll just sum this up with uh, this being about f finasteride versus dutasteride versus placebo. And they monitored a change in DHT. There's other information here that's also somewhat important too, like the the sample size, um, that there are 300 males, um, this was their age range, the, they had moderate to severe androgenetic alopecia. That's also, you know, you could argue that's pretty important too, but um, we have to be mindful of our time and we can't write down everything, otherwise we're just rewriting the paragraph. So I'm just going to write down what's key to me, which was um, what were they studying and how did they measure um, the efficacy of what they're studying, right? So finasteride, dutasteride, and placebo, they check the change in uh, DHT levels. Um, if I need to find more about uh, this um, study here, I could always just refer back to the passage. So you can look at your outline as kind of like a table of contents. You could um, use it as a guide so that some questions may not be answerable just using your outline. And you can use your outline instead to guide you where in the passage you might find the specific information you're looking for. So instead of having to uh, dig through from top to bottom, maybe in your outline you had a little note that in paragraph three, so-and-so was mentioned. So let's just dig into paragraph three and you'll save some time that way. So even though you might not, not, you might not be able to cover everything you want, you can still look at your outline as being useful and that it can be a guide for you in navigating and searching through a passage. But all right, after we got this outlined, um, we can go ahead and look at this figure here. I like the Tade P method. Um, when you encounter a, a figure on the MCAT, oftentimes you're kind of stuck eh, between two different thought processes. One is I could dig deep into this right now, really make sure I understand what the data is showing me, what uh, the results might be of this experiment, and so on. Um, However, um, you run the risk that none of the questions might even require you to go back to that figure or even need you to know the information that figure, ultimately being just like a waste of time. On the other hand, you might think, uh, I just want to move on and get to the questions. You know, maybe there's not going to be a question re revolving uh, or require me to know what this figure says, so I'll just come back to it later. Well, then you run the risk that you might not 
uh, get some very valuable information that affects your comprehension of the whole passage. Sometimes the figure plays a role um, in you understanding what the next paragraph says or what the whole passage is trying to say. So I like Tate P. This method gives you a nice high level overview of a certain passage and it's just very quick and easy to do. So Tade P, um, let's write this out here, is T-A-I-D and then P. So T stands for title. Our title is right here. Figure one is percent change in DHT from baseline. A is for axes, so we had weak and then we had percent change in DHT. I is your independent variable. So this is a variable that's being manipulated. So for us, this was whether you were in the finasteride group, the dutasteride group, or the control. So which treatment were you given? That is your independent variable. The dependent variable is the one that we're seeing as responding to our independent variable. And here it's going to be our percent change in DHT. Um, so if you're given finasteride, what was the change in DHT versus if you were given dutasteride versus if you were given a placebo? And then finally, P is a pattern. So we just quickly see, do we identify a pattern? And just looking at this, I see that there's a stark contrast between this line and these two lines. Right, so this is the control. So it seems like just looking at it, it's basically around 0% for the change in DHT over those 24 weeks. But when I look at the finasteride here in this uh, kind of bluish color, um, it looks like it got down to maybe around 75% at the low, or, or I guess the high in the most amount of DHT, um, or the percent change in DHT here. But it looks like the red line dutasteride is even higher. So my the quick pattern I've identified is it looks like dutasteride uh, does a better job at inhibiting uh, DHT um, formation versus finasteride, and finasteride does a better job than the placebo does. All right, and once I've got that, I'll move on now. So next paragraph, paragraph five, or is this, this is paragraph, yep, it's paragraph five. Additionally, the researchers also recorded the percent change in hair density to compare the efficacy of the drugs. All right, pretty short and simple. Um, don't need to write a whole lot. Maybe I'll just write change and hair and then density. So this little triangle like I had earlier, that's, you know, your change symbol, you could say. So this little delta, so change in hair density. All right, so that's another way they're now monitoring the efficacy of these drugs. So apply Tade P here as well. Title right here, percent change in hair density from baseline. All right, axes, we got weak. We got percent change in hair density. Independent variable, same as before, going to be which group were you in, which treatment were you given, finasteride, dutasteride, or a placebo. And then finally, our dependent variable is going to be uh, the percent change in hair density, because that's um, the one that's kind of responding to the change in the independent variable. All right, and then we do have our pattern, right, for P. So I know something similar, that the placebo group is hovering around 0%. If anything, they actually are going kind of... Um, you know, in, uh, in the negative y direction, right? There might be even like negative 3%, which makes sense if they have this condition um, and they're getting a placebo, meaning it's not being treated, then um, the density would probably decrease. So this makes sense where it's at, but I see a very stark difference between this and then these two here with finasteride and dutasteride. It looks like finasteride, this line in the middle, um, recovered hair density somewhere around maybe up to 30%, you know, maybe like 25%, you could say, um, after 24 weeks, but dutasteride even higher. We're looking at maybe around 40% even. So same as before, kind of the pattern I'm noticing is that dutasteride um, improves hair density better than finasteride and finasteride improves hair density better uh, than like a placebo. So now that I've got the pattern uh, established and consider my high yield overview or high level overview figure two complete. And with that, that also wraps up the passage so we can now move on to our questions. So question one, based on the information in the passage, which of the following would most likely increase hair density in individuals with androgenetic alopecia? A, upregulating the expression of SRD582, B, downregulating the expression of SRD581, C, upregulating testosterone production, or D, downregulating AR expression in hair follicles. All right, so let's recall what the theorized mechanism was for androgenetic alopecia. Paragraph two, we actually wrote this down a bit. Uh, we learned that DHT binds to this androgen receptor and that binding event triggers some sort of signaling cascade, uh, which leads to what they call uh, miniaturization of hair follicles. 
And additionally, in paragraph one, we learned that DHT comes from testosterone. And testosterone is an androgen. And so 5-AR, this 5-alpha reductase, takes one androgen, testosterone, and turns into a more potent androgen, dihydrotestosterone. And then from there, we have that mechanism we discussed. All right, so option A, talking about the upregulation of SRD5A2. Well, let's think about that. If we have this enzyme, type 2, which makes, which is found in the hair follicle, so probably very closely related with androgenetic alopecia, um, if it's being upregulated, that means it would be making more DHT, right? Because 5-AR converts testosterone into DHT. And if we have more DHT, then we'll have more DHT binding to the androgen receptor. If we have more of that binding occurring, then we're having uh, more of that signaling cascade, which eventually leads to miniaturization. So this doesn't really make sense. If we increase the expression of SRD5A2, we'll ultimately have more DHT and therefore more um, miniaturization of hair. So this can't possibly be the correct answer as our question is asking us which one is going to increase hair density. So the opposite of miniaturization, right? So let's move on to B, which says down-regulating SRD5A1 expression. SRD5A1 is found primarily in sweat glands as it's mentioned here in paragraph one. So, I mean, maybe, right? 5-AR or 5-A1, it, it does make DHT. So if we're reducing 5-A1, then there is some less DHT being made. So I can see this maybe working, but the fact that they specifically mentioned 5A1, SRD 5A1, which is found in the hair follicle, or found in the sweat glands, I mean, um, makes me a little suspicious of this. So I'll hold on this one. If I find something better, then I'll definitely go with that. But this could work out as being the best answer if the others are um, clearly incorrect. So we'll hold on B. C, upregulating testosterone production. Well, let's look back at our reasoning for um, answer A being incorrect. If we have more DHT, then we're gonna have less uh, hair density, right? So we're gonna have more miniaturization. So what does more testosterone do to our DHT levels? Well, if we have a higher amount of a reactant here, right? If we up our reactants, then we're gonna have more DHT being formed, right? We're talking about Le Chatelier's principle basically here, that more reaction is gonna lead to more products. So if we have more testosterone, then we'll probably have more DHT. Additionally, based on just what we know from the passage, that there's this androgen receptor, maybe it's possible that the testosterone could then bind to the androgen receptor, and maybe that also leads to a sort of uh, signaling cascade. Um, not sure about that 100%, but at the very least, that causes me to doubt this answer choice even more. But the main reasoning why I don't like this answer choice is just going off strictly from our MCAT knowledge about if we have more reactants, likely leads to more products. So we can eliminate C. Alrighty, and once C is eliminated, let's pull up D. D says down-regulating AR expression in the hair follicle. Alrighty, so the AR was the androgen receptor. And the androgen receptor, as we discussed, was involved with this androgenetic alopecia mechanism, where the DHT binds to the androgen receptor and then that causes miniaturization. So if we have less androgen receptor, then there would be less opportunities for DHT to bind and therefore less of the signaling cascade that leads to miniaturization. So I think D is gonna work out as a better answer because AR expression um, being lowered should definitely help with androgenetic alopecia. And unlike answer choice B, this has really focusing on the hair follicles, which is what we want for this condition, right? Sweat glands, that wasn't really mentioned as being a part of androgenetic alopecia. So here, D is going to work out as our best answer. All right, let's move on to question two. Which of the following accurately describes the resulting change in kinetics of SRD582 inhibition by finasteride? All right, tell us the Vmax increase, Vmax is decreased, Km is increased, Km is decreased. Well, this question basically requires us to know our enzymes. In paragraph two, we took note of this, that it is a competitive inhibitor, finasteride is, of SRD5A2. And so for the MCAT, you should know that competitive inhibitors, um, they will decrease the binding affinity of the enzyme to the substrate. So a decrease in binding affinity is gonna be an increase in the Km. And additionally, they don't actually impact the Vmax. So if they don't impact Vmax, we can cross those out. 
And like we said, if binding affinity of the enzyme to a substrate is decreased, that means our KM is increased. So C is going to be our best answer here. All right, let's move on to question three. Which of the following accurately describes the precursor to dihydrotestosterone? All right, so this is just a, uh, a wordy way to say testosterone because the precursor to dihydrotestosterone, as we discussed in this paragraph, is testosterone. So just think of this question as if it's saying, which of the following accurately describes testosterone? All right, one says it's derived from cholesterol. Well, we know that is true. Like all steroids, steroid hormones, testosterone is derived from cholesterol. So one, I like that. And also it's mentioned in all of these answer choices, so it has to be true. All right, two, it inhibits uh, GnRH secretion by the hypothalamus. So um, testosterone does exhibit negative feedback where it reduces its own production by inhibiting the GnRH secretion and FSH secretion. So two is gonna be true. But now let's look at three. It says it promotes FSH secretion by the interior pituitary. So that's the opposite of what I said, right? So testosterone is going to downregulate GnRH, or it's going to um, engage in this negative feedback um, to re reduce its own production by inhibiting the GnRH and the FSH secretion. So we can eliminate three. And now we have four. It binds to a receptor on the cell's membrane. All right, so testosterone is a uh, steroid hormone, and so that means it's nonpolar and is able to diffuse through the cell membrane. And so when it does diffuse through the cell membrane, it binds to a receptor in the cell um, and then carries on with what it needs to do. So this would apply to a like um, polar um, hormone, something maybe like insulin, um, where it binds to a, like it says, a receptor on the cell's membrane, but your steroid hormones like testosterone and probably like dihydrotestosterone as well, they're gonna go right through the cell's membrane and in, inside of the cell, they will bind to a receptor. So four can't be correct. So one and two, B is our best answer. All right, let's move on to question four. Based on the results of the study, the researchers are most likely to conclude that all right, so we have finasteride is more effective than dutasteride in treating androgenetic alopecia. Dutasteride is more effective than finasteride, or finasteride and dutasteride are equally effective, or that neither of them are effective at treating this condition. All right, so if we look back at figure one here, we identified a clear pattern that dutasteride, or yeah, our clear pattern was that dutasteride was doing a way better job than finasteride at um, inhibiting um, uh, DHT formation. And then paragraph two, dutasteride was doing a better job at fina than finasteride at um, the hair growth, right? There was more um, hair density in those uh, that were given dutasteride versus finasteride. So it, we can conclude that dutasteride is definitely effective. So, and so was finasteride, right? So was finasteride. So we can, based on that, actually just eliminate D because both of them were effective, but it's about which one was more effective or were they equally? Well, like we said, for both cases, we noticed dutasteride seems to be outperforming. The dutasteride group was outperforming the finasteride group. So B, dutasteride is more effective than finasteride in treating androgenetic alopecia, may be a conclusion that the researchers would make. All righty, let's go ahead and go to question five. Which of the following accurately describes SRD5A1? All right, so SRD5A1, that's our friend that is in the sweat glands. Right, so type two, SRD5A2 was in hair follicles, but type one was found in sweat glands. All right, well, they say it's found in the papillary layer of the dermis, the reticular layer of the dermis, or it's in the stratum corneum of the epidermis, or in the stratum uh, basal of the epidermis. All right, so this is a tricky question. Um, we need to recall our knowledge on the integumentary system. The passage mentions that SRD5A1, like we said, is found in sweat glands. Um, and sweat glands are found in the dermis. So just based on that information alone, uh, we can go ahead and eliminate C and D. And now the dermis is split into two layers. You got the papillary layer and you'll have a reticular layer. And in the papillary layer, you're gonna find loose connective tissue. Uh, but in the reticular layer is where you'll find sweat glands. So B is gonna be our best answer. 
kind of a tricky question really requires you to know some really low yield information potentially here um but it's all fair game for the mcat so it does show that content is something that's very valuable um for when you're taking the mcat knowing your content um, can help you win some easy points like this because this doesn't really require too much past analysis past analysis mostly just knowing um, what I know about the integumentary system, the epidermis, dermis, and so on. All right, and you know, if this is something that you, um, this was a question you missed, um, you know, make sure you do know what, what's found in each of these. We already discussed the dermis, so in the stratum corneum, you'll find like uh, keratinocytes, and um, in the stratum basal, you'll find uh, stem cells. So make sure you know what's found in each of these. But yep, B is our best answer, so let's move on to question six. Research has identified that a recessive allele in the X chromosome is associated with AR expression in the hair follicle. A female carrier and affected male plan to have two children. What is the likelihood that both children will be males with androgenetic alopecia? All right. And so this seems to be just a classic, um, just a very classic like genetics question. Looks like I'm gonna have to bring out the Punnett square for this, um, but Let's break this down. So they're telling us that it's a recessive allele and it's found on the X chromosome for the androgen receptor expression. Remember that androgen receptor on the hair follicle is the problem in androgenetic alopecia, or at least the binding of DHT is, but I guess expression, uh, if the androgen receptor is there, we kind of have a problem. Um, and this comes from the recessive allele on the X chromosome. And now we're given a scenario where you have a female carrier, so that means she has one copy of this recessive allele, but only one. The other X chromosome does not have that AR um, recessive allele there. Um, and then with a affected male, she if, uh, they plan to have two children. So the affected male is going to be um, someone that has a um, X chromosome that has the androgen receptor allele, that recessive allele, and then they'll just have a Y chromosome. And the Y chromosome is not going to be able to mask it. So for this condition, um, a male can't be a carrier. They're either affected or they're unaffected. And if they're unaffected, they're not going to be passing it on because they just don't have that allele. But if they do have the allele, there's nothing about like um, another X chromosome that can save you there. It's going to be you just have one X chromosome with the allele. And if you have that allele, you have the condition. So now we just got to use some statistics or we can bring out our Punnett square. So let's say we had the female here. She's a carrier. And we'll say this is equal to wild type and we'll say little a is equal to ar um that androgen receptor allele so she was big a and little a and he is little a because again he's affected and a y chromosome so they have kids the distribution for the genotypes we should see something like this so big a little a and we'll have little a little a big A with a Y, and then little a with a Y. So what does this say? This is 50% uh, are gonna be male and 50% are female, as expected, but 25%, so one in four are um, affected daughters, and then we have one in, right, because we have right here, or sorry, right here, I mean, where it's two little a's, that's gonna be our affected daughters. One in four are gonna be carrier daughters. Because what do they have? They got one maybe um, wild type from mom, but they got for sure one um, uh, androgen receptor allele from dad. And so they're gonna be a carrier. And now we also have one fourth of them being affected males, and then one, uh, right here actually is one fourth affected males, and one fourth being um, unaffected males. So now the question asks us that both children will be males with androgenetic alopecia. Well, we know that for the first child, right, that they have a one in four chance of being a male with androgenetic alopecia, right? So of this, only one of these squares is a male with the condition right here. But if they're having two children, so these are two independent events, what you do is you just take the probability for the first one and multiply by the probability for the second one. So for the first one, the probability was one in four. Again, right here is your male, one in four. So now you're having another child. Well, it's still gonna be one in four. This is gonna hold out for your second child, your third child, your fourth child, and so on. So if you're having two children 
and you want to see if they both will have the condition, you just multiply one fourth by one fourth and we get 116. So A is our best answer. All right, so that should wrap things up for us here with this passage. Um, really a lot of different information was covered or a lot of different topics were covered in this passage and the questions. Um, you had everything from enzymes to uh, hormones, um, you know, even your integumentary system with skin started coming along, you had genetics and um, also had to be able to reason through um, a, a set of data and, you know, work with some information that they give you in like the passage and, uh, um, you know, see if you can reason with that too. So, um, really great passage overall, could be tricky at times. Um, if there was stuff that you did, didn't understand, uh, highly recommend you review your content for those topics because these were, a lot of them were high yield topics. Like I said, enzymes, high yield, hormones, very high yield. Um, even your uh, genetics here, this is very high yield, very good chance you'll probably be drawing, a, maybe you'll be drawing a Punnett square on test day. So um, this little thing you learned back when you were maybe in like seventh or eighth grade, it's still coming back to haunt you when you're applying to medical school. So overall, uh, not a terrible passage, but I really like how much this passage covers. So make sure you review these answers, uh, review your questions, review your uh, test taking strategy in depth and how you approach uh, these passages in general. Um, and if you found this video helpful, please go ahead and give this video a like and subscribe to stay up to date with all of our content here on our YouTube channel. And uh, if you check out the link in the description below, you'll be able to sign up for a free MCAT question of the day where every day to your inbox, you get a MCAT question delivered right to you. All right, everyone. Once again, I hope you found this video helpful. Thanks so much for watching. We will see you next time.